Today uh, we'll start another new topic. Uh, this being the uh, lecture fourteen, and uh, the topic of discussion and today's lecture, and maybe it, it can uh, spill over to the next lecture as well, is pretreatment of hot metal. So <clears throat> we have produced hot metal. Now we pretreat it because the hot metal, as you know, which is produced from blast furnace will be taken for subsequent refining in steel making. So therefore, before we uh, take hot metal uh, for subsequent refining or steel making process, uh, you know, uh, certain processes uh, or certain refining actions can be carried out and which we call as pretreatment. And the necessity of pretreatment is as I have shown here and during, the, during my discussion on blast furnace for the last 10-11 uh, lectures that uh, the temperature in the Bosch region uh, can uh, you know dramatically uh, influence uh, the quality of the, or the composition of the hot metal. For example, if we, if we use a very high hearth temperature or you know, in the Bosch region if the temperature is exceedingly high in that case there is a chance that we may produce hot metal which will be extremely uh, you know high in silicon content. Uh, and then you have to remove this silicon and as you all know, you know from your basic chemistry course that steel making becomes autogenous because of the simple fact that carbon oxidation as well as silicon oxidation during steel making provides the necessary heat. These are extremely high endothermic reactions we have seen in the context of uh, you know enthalpy balance that if carbon oxidizes to carbon dioxide in that case 395,000 kilojoules per mole of carbon. Uh, that much of heat energy is released and similar is the value in order of magnitude is similar uh, for silicon dioxide also the silicon oxygen bond is very very strong. So, uh, if you have too much of silicon for example, in that case what happens uh, the steel making is not going to be economic. Uh, on the other hand if you have we will discuss this point when we uh, study steel making in greater detail uh, why it is not going to be economic that point will be. Uh, you know clarified in greater detail. Similarly, if silicon content is too small in that case what happens is uh, we may not get enough heat. So, silicon content is never too small ok. Silicon content because uh, we operate at high temperature in the blast furnace uh, and also that the gang material will contain silica. So, therefore, there is a chance um, of silica getting reduced in the blast furnace at least partially you know landing up in the hot metal itself. But most often uh, silicon can exceed the threshold value. For example, the composition of silicon in hot metal it will depend on you know can go vary from this range by percentage. And during oxidizing refining because the oxygen potential is very very high because steel making is an operation which is done under oxidizing environment. Uh, blast furnace is an operation or smelting of iron, iron ore in iron blast furnace is done under reducing atmosphere that we have seen partial pressure of oxygen in the blast furnace being of the order of 10 to the power minus 19 atmosphere or so. So, silicon this much of silicon you know 2.5 percent will produce enormous and you can imagine a converter size could be about 200 tons, 300 tons. So, how much of silica is going to be there uh, is you know and the amount of heat that is going to generate is going to be mind boggling. So, when the silicon content uh, is you know uh, hot metal varies between this uh, and this is slightly on the lower side and this is certainly much much on the higher side. So, there is a need you know for making the steel making process economic, making the steel making process more sustainable there is a necessity or there is an imperative need to reduce the content of the silicon in the hot metal before we can consider the hot metal suitable for charging into a steel making furnace. So, the pretreatment essentially implies therefore, with regard to the silicon removal of excess silicon. So, so I want in a pretreatment allows me because as you have seen that if the raft temperature fluctuates then what happen the hearth temperature as well as the Bosch temperature will also fluctuate as a result of which silicon content will also fluctuate. But we want you know steel making will be done most accurately most scientifically provided we ensure that hot metal you know has an unique composition on a daily basis 24 7 for 365 days hot metal if you can produce hot metal 
you know with a consistent composition plus minus you know uh, something like 0, 50 ppm or 100 ppm something of that sort then I think you will be running the plant most economically. But that is a very big challenge and blast furnace perhaps it is impossible. So, pretreatment allows us to condition the feed for steel making that is condition the hot metal and bring it to such a composition which can give us the maximum advantage and uh, allows us you know maximum uh, maneuverability as far as the steel making process is concerned. Similarly, we have also seen you know the, we are going to discuss today more much more lucidly that sulfur removal uh, can take place only under reducing atmosphere that I have said in the class that we require uh, a basic slag and we require a reducing environment and blast furnace is perhaps the most uh, suitable place for removal of uh, sulfur. Uh, but unfortunately what happens is in the blast furnace we are not able to eliminate sulfur because of certain operating reasons to a desire you know um, optimum level. Now, the sulfur in hot metal also can vary and sulfur content will vary as we have seen that the, okay, the atmosphere is reducing, but we require a high basic slag, but we may not be able to maintain a very high basic slag because very high basic slag means we have lot of lime into it and to keep the slag fluid because desulfurization as I have written the equation in that molecular form that iron sulfide okay, and then carbon dissolved in hot metal and then we have calcium oxide which is slag. So, it is a slag metal reaction and that gives us the calcium sulfide goes to the slag, iron is produced in the metal and CO which evolves as gas. This is a slag metal reaction it takes where the metal comes in contact with the slag and there is an interface it is at that interface this particular reaction is taking place. So, it is a slag metal reaction and basically what happens is if we try to it is clear that more the concentration of CO in the slag this reaction will have a tendency uh, to go from left to right. But as I said that we may not have you know we may not be able to have a very large CO content and that is why if you remember I said that the blast furnace slag basicity is 1.1, 1.2 something of that sort. On the other hand in steel making because we have excess temperature because of carbon oxidation, silicon oxidation because this contains so, so much of silicon, so much of carbon will produce enormous heat and that will make avenue for using a very large basic slag, uh, a slag with large basicity and the basicity will go somewhere around 3.5 to 4, but that is not possible in blast furnace. If you want to produce a slag with a viscous, you know, basicity of 2, you have to jack up the temperature because you have to keep the slag fluid because this is a slag metal reaction. So, the fluidity of the slag is a very important parameter here, we will discuss that when you write the kinetic equations, okay, a kinetic equation for the sulfurization process. So, you are constrained to limit the basicity and you know because you do not want to go to the high temperature because if you go to high temperature then the silicon content of the hot metal is going to be increased. So, there has to be a compromise. It is interesting that this sulfur content basically can go from blast furnace can remove sulfur there is no doubt about it. Blast furnace is the site where you should try to eliminate sulfur uh, to the extent possible because in steel making you will not be able to eliminate sulfur because of the simple fact that one of the basic condition that you require you know and reducing environment is not satisfied in steel making. So, therefore, blast furnace. So, this is uh, I would say uh, you know in the hot metal it can go from a range of 0 0.4 to about uh, uh, I would say 1 wet percentage or something like that but percentage. And this sulfur what is the major source of sulfur? The major source of sulfur in pig iron or hot metal is the coke. Indian coke unfortunately contains much smaller amount of sulfur than the foreign cokes, but the Indian coke is known to be containing an enormous amount of coke ash. So, our coke ash can go to 20 25 percentage. On the other hand high quality imported coke can have ash content of the order of 7 percent 8 percent or so, but our advantage is that with the coke contains less amount of sulfur, but yet we are not able to produce very low sulfur because of the simple fact that we have an adverse 
silica to alumina ratio in your iron ore or you know there will be chances of getting because of the silica content of the ore and the gang material uh, the chances of getting a high silicon content pig iron will result. Any attempt any attempt to reduce sulfur okay, drastically in the Indian blast furnace will cause a significant amount of it will be at the cost of considerable amount of silicon transfer uh, to the hot metal itself which certainly is not desirable. And what we need in the steel making virtually this silicon is going to be oxidized completely. So, there will be no traces of silicon left or very little silicon left maybe 10 ppm 5 ppm or so. And similarly when you refine if you do pretreatment and if your blast furnace operation is correct and you know in steel making also if you can do secondary steel making correct then the final requirement of sulfur could be as low as this is wet percentage essentially means this is 30 ppm that is what it is. So, wet percentage if you multiply it by 10 to the power 4 then you get uh, what is known as uh, the parts per million unit. So, this is the final value of the desir desirable value. So, silicon could be very high in the peak you know peak iron and also the sulfur could be also very high this is the range of sulfur on the other hand we require a very small amount of sulfur itself and that presence of silicon high silicon will jeopardize the steel making reactor or steel making operation because of extremely high temperature and that a very high sulfur content in the peak iron will be disadvantageous as far as steel making is concerned because steel making is oxidizing environment we cannot eliminate sulfur. So, it is therefore imperative that before we do steel making you know attempt must be made to control silicon attempt must be made to control sulfur and bring it to a more or less acceptable limit and that should be the starting point from steel making. What is the advantage of that if you can reduce silicon content okay, silicon content of the hot metal obviously, you will require less amount of lime to be charged in steel making. So, you will save on some money. Okay. So, similarly if you have sulfur content okay, you will be able to produce good quality steel which will contain less amount of sulfur. So, an improvement in quality will be there savings in material will be there and that you can do you know uh, achieve uh, provided uh, you attempt to do carry out pretreatment of the hot metal itself. In some plants not only silicon is removed not only sulfur is removed but also phosphorus is removed. We will see that for steel making to removal of phosphorus is not an important issue at all. All the conditions necessary for phosphorus elimination is satisfied in steel making. While in blast furnace we cannot even eliminate 1 ppm of phosphorus because phosphorus elimination requires an oxidizing environment and high basicity and blast furnace has reducing environment. So, I said with the iron iron oxide line and phosphorus phosphorus pentoxide line in the lingam diagram are extremely close. So, if all the iron is reduced it essentially implies all the phosphorus is reduced as well and all reduced elements go to the metal phase and as a result of which phosphorus present in the charge is totally reduced in the iron blast furnace and finally land up in the hot metal itself. That poses no problem because steel making is a site for <coughs> phosphorus elimination. Now, if, if phosphorus can also be eliminated so the charge hot metal will contain some amount of phosphorus that will again vary. So, it can go phosphorus can you know depending on the charge content I do not know can be high phosphorus content could go go up give me give you phosphorus in the hot metal up to about 1 wet percentage of so. So, depending on the phosphorus content you know I would say that 0 0.1 wet percentage phosphorus is a sometimes you know you got high phosphorus so, so you can get something like 0 0.08 or something like that 800 ppm or something like that and the final phosphorus that you will require uh, that could be you know depending on the usage could be again about 20 ppm 30 ppm and phosphorus and sulfur as you will know are detrimental uh, to the mechanical properties of steel. So, we would like to. So, range of phosphorus can be present in the hot metal higher the phosphorus content of the ore more is going to be the phosphorus content of the hot metal and if you have this much of phosphorus more or less typically present in uh, hot metal then you have to refine it to bring it and this poses no problem except that you know phosphorus elimination will require a basic condition as we will see. So, lime addition will have to be there. So, the phosphorus elimination happens uh, you know, at the expense of uh, the cost of lime. We must understand that there is an indirect relationship between silicon content of the hot metal 
and phosphorus content of the hot metal. If silicon content of the hot metal is too large, then the heat evolved is so large that dephosphorization is not possible because dephosphorization is an exothermic reaction. It is facilitated at little bit to low temperature, but that you have lot of silicon, lot of heat is being evolved and as a result of which phosphorus reversion can take place because of that kind of a high temperature or phosphorus elimination may not take place unless you have cooled down the metal you know during refining by the addition of you know some solid coolants or so which we will again discuss in greater detail later on. So, I think I have given you enough background to make the point that why we should go for pretreatment of the hot metal because we are unable to provide the dream composition necessary for making steel make you know for steel making which will allow us to consider steel making you know as a uh, very well established technique and very profitable uh, technique. So, by we are tailor making you know it is a hot metal composition is tailor made through pretreatment and it is you know from the after the pretreatment we get a composition which we can uh, use in steel making uh, very profitably and uh, maneuver the process also very easily. If you can control both silicon, sulfur and phosphorus through pretreatment then what it turns out that there is no silicon to be removed in steel making, no sulfur to be removed in steel making, no phosphorus to be removed in steel making. In that case what you have you have to just eliminate carbon okay? and carbon because the carbon oxidizes and removes that carbon monoxide. So, you do not generate any slag, oxidation of silica will generate silicon will generate silica and as a result of which you will have to add flux form calcium silicate that is the slack phase. Similarly, if you want to eliminate phosphorus, phosphorus will be tied up as calcium phosphate. So, you have to add calcium oxide. So, slag is going to be generated, but once if you say that sir I have a composition, I have controlled through pretreatment my sulfur content, my phosphorus content etcetera you know and there is nothing to be eliminated as far as these three elements are concerned that is silicon, sulfur and phosphorus. I would say you have land up in a situation which is called slagless steel making that means carbon will oxidize, carbon will make the steel making autogenous, but carbon because it is going to escape as CO no slag is going to be generated and that is. So, therefore, controlling the silicon content, controlling phosphorus, controlling sulfur through pretreatment is a move in the direction of less and less slag during steel making process or towards it is a march towards the slagless steel making process or minimal slag in the steel. The slag volume poses big problem in steel making reactors. So, smaller is the slag volume better is the maneuverability of the steel making process. With this introduction now let us go to the first topic which we call as the desiliconization. Desiliconization of hot metal. Desiliconization, if you if you draw the blast furnace for example, so the blast furnace goes I will do only part of it I will draw to show you what it is. So, this is the hearth okay. uh, this is that's a very big figure I have drawn now. So, this is the uh, refractory lining and this is the blast furnace. Okay. So, so long I have been drawing the left half now I have so you can go like this and then it can taper like this I have that is the section that is important not important for us. So, this is our blast furnace I would say the tap hole. So, we have <coughs> and there we have hot metal here and slag here, there is a slag here and we have hot metal uh, there ok. I will just write it show it here and this is our hot metal. So, the hot metal is filled here and the hot metal we have here what is known as the blast furnace trough for the blast furnace runner. So, when the tap hole is open, this goes something like this. That is the runner 
blast furnace runner lined with refractory vessels. And through this actually the molten metal is taken out of the blast furnace, it is put in a put in ladles or in torpedo vessels and then it is transported to the steel making reactor. So, that is the hot metal stream because it is this angle is about I have drawn it little steeper this is about 10 degrees uh, tilted and this is the hot metal stream and this is the level and we have a slag skimmer somewhere here and the slag separates out here. And at here what happens is there is a perpendicular direction the slag can travel perpendicularly there is another duct here. So, which will take this overflow uh, into <coughs> the metal will not go there, but the slag will go there. Okay. So, this is how the slag is being generated this is the slag which is being generated. And when you pour the molten you know tap the molten this is called tapping operation or uh, tapping of the blast furnace it is done periodically and uh, this is the trough which is called the blast furnace trough and when molten metal flows like this there is an enormous amount of molten metal coming out you know, per minute several uh, you know maybe 100 tons or something like that. Uh, small blast furnaces may be 50, 55 tons per minute or something like that. So, we have air bubbles also which are entrained and we have. So, there is a huge amount of kinetic energy of the stream and there is a very good amount of stirring going on here and it is as you can see here both slag you know you have slag metal and gas they are mixed uh, providing a huge amount of addition. Typically desiliconization is done in the blast furnace runner. It can also be done uh, you know uh, in downstream process after you have taken the hot metal then you can in the either in this ladle, ladle or in the silicon uh, the ladle will look like a cylindrical vessel marginally tapered okay. on the other hand the torpedo vessels are like they are all on wheels actually that is a torpedo vessel this looks like you know those diesel carrying uh, uh, railway tankers okay, that is the way they look like actually you cannot miss if you go to a steel plant and see huge vessels you know containing lot of hot metals uh, uh, in them. So, it is uh, you can they are refractory line so you can you can store molten metal uh, similarly slag if you have molten metal here then the ladles are also going to be covered. Uh, so, this is ladle and this is torpedo car. Okay. So, you can these are called the transfer vessels via this you have steel make you know, iron making unit then the steel making unit is a little bit far away uh, maybe 100 meters 200 meters meters because the blast furnace itself is surrounded by so many things as we know. So, therefore, the steel making shops you know you cannot really uh, flow them straight to the steel making reactor. So, there has to be a transfer vessels and in the transfer vessels what happens is we do not want heat to uh, be lost and that is why they are refractory line vessels and they are also physically covered vessels. So, two types of and in this transfer vessels a desiliconization operation can also be taken out take carried out, but desiliconization operation is most uh, commonly carried out in the blast furnace runner itself. How it is carried out? We have for example, mill scale which is FEO mill scale means because after steel making we are going to be producing lot of solid steel okay? and this steel will undergo oxidation and as a result of which there are scales which will form. Okay? These scales are washed removed before the products are actually uh, you know handed over to the customer. So, in the process of delivering the final product from liquid iron via steel making a steel plant will generate enormous amount of scales okay? steel scales and these scales are essentially FEO they are in you know very friable material actually and this mill scales can be added to the flowing hot metal itself and there is a huge amount of churning motion here. It is like uh, the kind of uh, you know water flow in a bucket when you open the tap and then you you know observe that how vigorously the bucket water contained in the bucket is stirred. it is the same kind of a scenario which is taking place here. So, the melt is extensively stirred and if you put 
FUO, you know, powders of FUO or small little pieces of FUO here, that FUO tends to get immediately mixed. Now, you have carbon and you have silicon dissolved, but silicon has much higher affinity towards oxygen. So, the moment FUO is there, you know, uh, and FUO is a low melting point constituents that we all know. So, as a result of which what happens is this silicon will try to predominantly react with the oxygen and it will try to snatch the oxygen because silicon has the, if you look at the Ellingham diagram at about 1350 degree centigrade. So, that is the hot metal temperature in India as we say that our, we cannot go to 1450 or 50, you know uh, 1475 degree centigrade uh, as I have indicated. So, the blast furnace hot metal will be tapped under Indian condition about 1350, otherwise there is a danger of getting too much of silicon in the hot metal itself. But in as foreign blast furnaces where their silicon silica content of the charge is smaller, one can go to you know 1450 or something like a higher blast, blast furnace temperature. So, we have hot metal which flows here uh, and we have vigorous amount of stirring. So, at that temperature, if you look at the Ellingham diagram, you will find that you know oxygen has the largest affinity towards silicon rather than towards carbon. And so, list with ox Fe, uh, intermediate with carbon and maximum with Si. So, whatever oxygen you have supplied via the mill scale, they will try to react with silicon and as a result of which uh, silica will form. You can also add lime powder here to fix this silica and then calcium silicate slag will form or alternatively FeO SiO2 can also form and this slag being lighter they will be float up and they may be mixed with the blast furnace slags should the slag be carried over here and they can be skimmed off uh, or routed, rerouted in a favorable direction using the slag skimmer which is this particular part in the whole system. So, it is a straightforward, very simple, thermodynamically feasible and because the kinetic conditions are favorable here you require this is again you know uh, this reactions are for example, if you have silicon dissolved in hot metal and FeO that you have added because the oxide does not dissolve, it is again a slag metal reaction and because the agitation is going to be very, very large. So, therefore, I can say that this is a favorable site. This part region you may not see good you know lot of silica may float up uh, sorry if you may float up to the free surface, but here you know good mixing condition is there. So, therefore, the slag metal is a very nice site for conducting uh, you know uh, the desiliconization operation in the runner itself. So, we want the slag and the metal to be mixed in order to convert silicon present into a silica. Alternatively, you can do the same practice here also and then uh, you can you know you will require some kind of a stirring uh, to be applied in the system in order to expedite. So, you can inject nitrogen also in the system or if you have a pedal you know you can start it with a pedal, but as I say that if just simple desilicanization is most uh, popular in uh, the blast furnace runner itself if you do not have to do an extensive amount of desilicanization, extensive des desilicanization will require that you carry uh, desilicanization operation either in the ladle or in the torpedo. Now, this is enough for us, so we should be able to control. Uh, we can carry out thermodynamics and kinetics calculations and find out how much of reagents will be necessary, what should be the rate of addition, etc. And then, uh, you know, uh, through stoichiometry, we should be able to also see that, you know, to reduce silicon, eliminate silicon, uh, how much of FeO to be added, and all these cal calculations will tell us that we are taking advantage of the existing scenario. We do not have to do anything to introduce stirring you know high temperature is already there, these are the prevalence in the scenario, we have to just regulate that how much of mill scale really we have to add, what should be the rate of addition of the mill scale into this region. So, the such that this hot metal silicon which comes out, okay, it is in the favorable range and that favorable range is within 0 0.6 and 1.0 weight percentage. Let us now look at desulphurization operations. <clears throat> desulfurization. These are also called uh, external desiliconization. 
silicon removal outside the blast furnace is referred to as external desiliconization. Removal of sulfur outside the blast furnace will also be termed as external desulfurization or we can say pretreatment of hot metal. Okay? Now, in a molecular form, I have written this equation that molten metal uh, is carbon and then we have and then we get calcium sulfide and then <coughs> gases will be written with second bracket. Uh, parent phase or those elements which are in metal dissolved in metal in third bracket and uh, the oxides are the slag forming reagents in the first bracket. This is the molecular form of the desulfurization equation uh, reaction and as we have seen I repeat again we require a basic environment, we require a reducing environment the presence of carbon is necessary and uh, this reaction as such is an exothermic reaction. On the other hand, if you do not consider this for example, uh, if, if you write the result that there is no carbon here, then you write the equation like this. Then this equation, the temperature has very little effect because the sulfur oxygen, you know, sulfur C, uh, and oxygen, the bond strength of sulfur and oxygen with Fe or Ca are almost of the same. Uh, intensity. So, because their bond intensity, so the thermal effects of this particular equation the way I have represented now, uh, the temperature does not have a very significant effect. But the moment I write it like this, then there is exothermic heat generation because of carbon monoxide and this becomes an exothermic reaction. So, it is going to be facilitated as at relatively low temperature, but I have indicated explicitly when I was talking about blast furnace reactions in the heart that we require a higher temperature actually higher temperature is seen to facilitate desulfurization. It is because of not thermodynamic reasons, but kinetic reasons because the slack fluidity which is an important part because transport through the phases because this inter reaction takes place at the interface slack metal interface. So, there is a transport to the interface uh, you know hidden in the whole chemical process that I have represented here and those transport within the slack phase and the metal phase and particularly the slack phase will be a function of the fluidity of the slag and that fluidity will be a function of temperature and that shows higher fluidity will happen at high temperature. So, therefore, at high temperature this reaction is going to be facilitated. Typically desulfurization reaction is written because slag metal reactions are written in ionic form. So, we will write that sulfur which is in the metal phase and this is in the this is the measure of iron sulfide and this is the measure of calcium oxide and this that is how the sulfur transfer takes place. <coughs> so, the moment in steel making what happens is because I have carbon dissolved in the metal that carbon will eliminate this oxygen. So, if the product is being continuously removed in that case the reaction will facilitate in the forward direction. Okay. So, removal of oxygen on the other hand if oxygen there is no agent to remove oxygen then oxygen concentration will increase and that will force this reaction going to the reverse direction and that is what I say a higher oxygen potential will not facilitate sulfur transfer from metal to slag on the other hand if there is a reducing environment if you can take the oxygen out in that case we can say that there will be continuous transfer or a significant transfer of sulfur from the metal phase to the slag phase. Now, desulfurization I want to discuss the thermodynamics and I want to find out that uh, you know what are the certain characteristics and certain important terminologies. Now, we can consider the slag metal reaction uh, in terms of two sub reactions to discuss the theory of uh, desulfurization thermodynamics of desulfurization reactions and one such reaction is the gas metal reaction relevant gas metal reaction sorry first is I will write gas slag reaction. And then I will write gas metal reaction. And if we maneuver the two equations, we will get this slag metal uh, reactions. 
So, sulfur which is in the gas phase okay, S2 and second bracket we have here and we will say that it is slag. So, O2 minus and that gives us <coughs> sulfur from the gas it will go to the slag. So, sulfur will be minus 2 and then oxygen is going to be <coughs> and then we will write half S2 and this is this going to be gas phase. And we can write the equilibrium constant here K1 and that equilibrium constant I will write as PO2 by PS2 and because it is half so it is where square root into activity of sulphur in the slag divided by activity of oxygen and iron in the slag. Similarly, we can <coughs> say that this is equal to PO2 by PS2 and then we can remember write this as what percentage sulphur using our uh, thermodynamic activity composition relationship in the slag multiplied by F s to minus that is the activity coefficient of first bracket essential integrates. So, we have split out the activity of you know, sulphur uh, an ion in the slag in terms of its wet percentage in the slag divided by the activity of activity coefficient that f is the activity coefficient and this is a O2 minus. Let us write the gas metal reaction. The gas metal reaction is we have sulfur in the metal okay, and then we have <coughs> oxygen in the gas phase so half O2 that is the gas in the metal and then we have sulfur in the gas phase and then we have oxygen in the metal. And if you have if you can write down the K2 another equilibrium constant for this and these two reactions can be manipulated if you just add we will get the slag metal reactions and there we say that we have uh, PS2 by PO2 under root into activity of oxygen and this is dilute solution Henry's law and then we have activity of sulphur okay. and then we can say that this is also equal to square root the similar approach P s 2 by P o 2 into H o divided by what percentage sulphur in the metal and activity coefficient of sulphur in the metal that is what is. I want to now eliminate this because elimination of this will give us necessary relationship because if we add up we get this where the gas phase is not there. So, from K 1 relationship where we get P 1 P o 2 by P s o 2. So, I can write down that K 2 if we substitute uh, you know. So, this substitution is going to take place in the expression of K 2 the square root P s 2 by P o 2 is going to be substituted on the basis of this equation and then I can see that what do I get here is K 2 is equal to for example, K 2 is going to be equal to uh, if you take it like this then we have uh, P s 2 by P o 2. So, this is going to be activity of S 2 minus okay, and that is going to be uh, first bracket and then we have K 1 into activity of 2 minus that is what is going to be <coughs> there. So, we have substituted in place of this and then we have <coughs> H O divided by what H s. So, what percentage sulphur into activity coefficient of sulphur. And this we have seen that this is going to be equal to 
A S 2 I have written in terms of wet percentage sulphur okay, that is in the slack phase multiplied by F S 2 minus there is the activity coefficient and this is K 1 A O 2 minus into H O. What I am trying to do? I am trying to find out a ratio of wet percentage sulphur in the slag to wet percentage sulphur which represents the efficiency of sulphur removal actually, thermodynamic efficiency of sulphur removal which also called the sulphur partition coefficient and is represented by the notation LS okay? and then we have wet percentage sulphur into activity of sulphur in the metal. So, we get here uh, this parameter now for example, the inverse of this parameter I will write down here has given an important name that we will see later on. So, let me see we get K 2. Okay. So, <coughs> if we take this to this particular side then what we are going to get? We are going to get here. So, we retain this term, we retain here this term, we retain here this term and then we get what? We get wet percentage of sulphur in the slag and wet percentage of sulphur in the metal and on the left hand side we are going to get K 2 into we will get one parameter which is K A O 2 minus divided by F S 2 minus in the slag and then we have <coughs> F s will go up and then we have H o will go down. In thermodynamic literature this is given a special name which is called the C s the sulphide capacity of the slag okay? and the sulphide capacity of the slag depends on this is the para, this is the index of basicity. It is a function of the basicity of the slag, and it is a function of the activity coefficient in the slag. You must understand that if you have a very stable phase, you know, uh, in that case, the activity coefficient uh, is going to be extremely small. On the other hand, if you have something which is very loose, okay, not tied, you know, you know, tied up very strongly, in that case, the activity coefficient uh, is going to be very very large. So, if lime can fix sulphur as calcium sulphide, sulphur, sulphur will exhibit a very low uh, activity coefficient. On the other hand, the smaller is the content of lime in the slag, you know, higher is going to be the activity coefficient itself. So, therefore, we can say that this comes out to be the final expression is K2 hmm, into C s sulphide capacity into F s divided by H O and if you take logarithm on both side then you get the final expression that log of the partition coefficient you get log L s is equal to log K 2 plus log C s plus log F s minus log what does indicates these are the three parameters which increases what we are looking for we try to have the maximum sulfur in the slag itself okay to obtain the maximum value of the sulfur in the slag maximum removal of slag in the process we understand that these three parameters must be as high as possible and these parameters which is presented by a negative sign must be as small as uh, possible Okay, and therefore, we can see that temperature will have an effect because the equilibrium constant is a function. C s and from this particular relationship 
the role of temperature is not quite obvious because Cs itself is a function of temperature because Cs contains an equilibrium constant which itself is a function of temperature. So, this is a this is also a function of temperature this is also an implicitly function of temperature. So, temperature has certain role okay, may not be to that significant level and then but it is understood from here clearly that higher is the activity coefficient of sulphur in the melt more will be the chances of getting a high value of Ls smaller is the oxygen content of uh, the melt uh, greater will be the chances of getting a higher. So, therefore, smaller value of this essentially means we have a reducing environment log f s higher value of activity coefficient essentially means that there should be some other elements dissolved which will not allow iron to bond with sulphur. So, iron can let sulphur go and that is the case when we say that the activity coefficient of sulphur in the melt is very very large. Okay? And Incidentally, the presence of carbon because iron has a great affinity towards carbon, the presence of carbon increases the activity coefficient of sulfur in the melt itself. So, that creates a scenario for obtaining a higher partition uh, coefficient or separation ratio between removal uh, to the slack phase itself. And obviously, we require a li large Cs value, and that Cs is going to be essential. Uh, you know obtain that if you have uh, you know high lime content and that high lime content will not only give rise to and um, you know the basic constituents improve the ionic uh, concentrations of uh, calcium in the slack phase, but also simultaneously reduce the activity coefficient of sulphur in the slack phase. So, therefore, a high sulphide capacity and high activity coefficient of sulphur in the melt and smaller amount of uh, oxygen dissolved in the melt are all conducive to obtaining a high partition ratio in the system itself. And as I said that if you plot the C s value and the C s has a unit of weight percentage as you can see here that if you write down it will have you know activity coefficient is dimensionless. So, you can check that the sulphide capacity will come out to be in weight percentage and if you plot two different temperatures one could be 16 for a given slag and one other could be 1550 then you see higher is the temperature higher is uh, the sulphide capacity of the slag and this uh, basically <coughs> comes out you know uh, from the role of uh, that that this k1 is a function of uh, what do you call uh, the temperature so this equilibrium constant is a function of temperature and it shows that if you increase the temperature you do get you know an enhanced uh, C s or sulphide capacity of the slag. So, temperature not so much though temperature uh, the basicity of the slag the oxygen potential of the metal the, sun, uh, the activity coefficient uh, uh, of sulphur in the melt and activity coefficient of sulphide and iron in the slag these are important variables that will allow us to obtain a great amount a high amount of desulphurization in the system. So, we will always therefore, do this will tell us now that what are the reagents which can be used you know uh, for desulphurization. Now, for example, every time the desulphurization reagents basically is magnesium calcium oxide basically or magnesium calcium oxide and sometimes calcium fluoride which is uh, added these are the desulphides. So, this is an 80 percent 20 percent 80 percent ratio and this is about 15 percent 75 percent and <coughs> sorry 80 percent and 5 percent ratio. So, calcium fluoride basically uh, increases uh, the fluidity of the slag, but fluorides because the slags are dumped or used somewhere else subsequently. So, fluorides today are not desirable in the slag phase itself. So, therefore, we can say that we will have uh, desulphurization done and that desulphurization will take place because magnesium is also a very high uh, you know um, it has great affinity towards uh, sulphur. So, magnesium under steel making condition exists as magnesium gas. So, it is going to be a gas metal reaction and the rate of the reactions could be very very fast. So, the magnesium can dissolve magnesium can react with a gas with sulphur which is dissolved form magnesium sulphide. 
similarly calcium oxide okay can react with uh, magnesium uh, uh, plus uh, magnesium and then so this is gas actually so I would write this and that gives rise to magnesium oxide and calcium and then the calcium is going to be uh, this is a dissolved calcium of course and that dissolved calcium can take part in accordance with the same equation and cause uh, desulfurization. Now, so desulfurization is also carried out either in little or in torpedo, torpedo vessels. Desulfurization as we see will be carried out by addition of this reagents either this or this and we know that already we have a very high carbon content in the melt itself. So, high activity coefficient of sulfur in the metal phase, a reducing environment, uh, these are all ensured in the melt phase itself. So, we do not have to you know much worry about the HO parameter which itself is extremely small. So, what you have to now ensure that we maintain a basic environment and we maintain sufficient fluid of fluidity of the cell uh, uh, slag and why do you want to maintain fluidity of the slag that will be you know known to us if you consider the kinetics of the slag metal reaction and if you know that the slag metal reactions are first order reactions and the first order reactions basically essentially tells us that the rate of transport is, is equal to mass transfer coefficient area and then this is the sulfur concentration. So, I would write small c huh? not sulfide capacity this is sulfur concentration in the bulk minus the sulfur concentration in the interface because when you say that desulfurization is mass transfer control basically it is a melt phase transport process. So, therefore, we can say that the chemical reaction at, at taking place at the equilibrium can be virtually uh, you know taken to be at uh, equilibrium. So, we have transport of sulfur from the metal to the slag phase transport of CO from the slag to the interface and then the CO as well as sulfur meet exchange takes place calcium sulphide goes to the slag phase oxygen goes to the metal phase these are the transport processes and in the process the chemical reaction which takes place at the interface okay which is represented you know which is a summation of these two particular reactions okay this takes place at the interface and this is at equilibrium and this essentially represents the equilibrium concentration and this is the bulk concentration which is changing as a function of the processing time this is the mass transfer coefficient this is the area interfacial area and that represents the net rate and we will see the consequence of this when we continue our discussion you know on pretreatment of hot metal in the next lecture. <coughs>